Um, so what the, the basis of what I wanted to cover today, um, and very quickly just an overview of colonization. I know probably many of you coming here will have a very in-depth understanding of colonization, and maybe some of you will have less of an understanding of colonization. So I just wanted to very quickly sort of set a, a as much as sort of I need to say for the presentation so that, so that um, we have a common um, starting point. And talk a little bit about First Nation data sovereignty and what that is and what the path to um, data sovereignty has looked like um, in Ontario, uh, in particular, Canada more broadly, but in Ontario specifically, and the path we've been on. And then um, talk about uh, the, the research, the, the actual research uh, that, that I'm involved with, with the First Nations Aging Study um, in collaboration with the Chiefs of Ontario and, um, and some of the other work that's happening um, in parallel to that. So that's where, that's where we're going. Um, so the, the, the very, very brief, like I hesitate to say that it's an overview of colonization, but just like an introduction, just what, I, what we need to have as a common ground. So um, starting, uh, from the perspective of, um, you know, of settlers, uh, really part of what set the foundation for what happened later um, is, is part of what the doctrine of discovery. So are people familiar with the doctrine of discovery? Okay, so about half, half, um, that's my scientific epidemiology <laughs> way of <laughs> doing research. Um, but, but basically, um, Really, this, the, these, these were, um, the doctrine of discovery gave Christian explorers the right to claim lands that they discovered. That's essentially, and to lay claim to those lands, um, and if the land was not inhabited by Christians, then it was available to be discovered, claimed, and that the, the people should be converted or, or, um, or not spared at all. So that's the, the very, um, that's, that's an important key to understanding colonization, um, in a sense, because many times students um, or people I'm talking to say, but why, but why would things happen? Why would things happen this way? And when this is the, the culture um, of the explorers and the, and the people who are settling, then it makes it a little bit easier to understand. So that's why I raised that. So it's something you can look up if you if you if you were one of the people who didn't know about the doctrine of discovery. And in 1763, there is the Royal Proclamation, another thing you can look up if it's not something that you're familiar with. And it really, um, the Royal Proclamation came from the British Crown and it established First Nations people as legitimate occupants of the land. Um, so it's, it's very important in the context of um, the history of of, of settlement in Canada because it, it really did um, set a foundation um, that we can go back to where there's a recognition that there were people and that they were legitimate occupants of the land. Because um, I recently traveled you know, to Australia and was talking in a more international context about um, sovereignty and data sovereignty. And without that foundation, it's actually a little bit more tricky. You know, we've heard of things like um, terra, terra nullius and the, like where, where um, there was no recognition that there were people, um, that it, it makes things a bit more difficult. So these were some of the foundational bits that, that happened. Now the Indian Act is, is one of the, it's very relevant to what I'm going to talk about today, so I just wanted to introduce it to you. So the Indian Act um, was established in um, 1876, but it was it, it was pulling together three different existing acts and putting it into one. Um, so those other acts um, sort of started to come into place in the 1850s. Um, and they were all um, acts that, so one was called the Gradual Civilization Act, which encouraged enfranchisement. Do you know what enfranchisement is? Yeah, so it's, it, so, okay, so we're being recorded, so I'll just keep talking. I won't just try and engage with the audience. Um, <laughs> So I'll just have you nod or shake your head. <laughs> um, but the, I think um, the real purpose was to, to, you know, the express purpose was to integrate and civilize um, people who, who were not part of the settlers. Um, and 
the, um, so that was one part of what came, went into the Indian Act. Other parts were the British North America Act, which assigned Indians as a federal government responsibility, and the Gradual Enfranchisement Act, which gave the power to Indian Affairs to sort of um, and create elected band councils. Like the structure that we know right now in First Nation communities with bands and elected chiefs, that's a, that's a colonial system that was imposed through these acts. Um, and in, in a sense, the Indian Act as they brought all those things together. So another thing you can look up because we've got, and you should read it, like you should, you should definitely read the Indian Act. It's very exciting. So, but the purpose of the Indian Act was explicit. The great aim of our legislation has been to do away with the tribal system and assimilate the Indian people in all respects with other inhabitants of the Dominion as speedily as they are fit to change. So the purpose is assimilation. Another component of the legislation and the policy reality um, of the times was that in order to educate the children properly, you must separate them from their families. Some people may say this is hard, but if we want to civilize them, we must do that. Duncan Campbell Scott said, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. Our objective is to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic and there is no Indian question. So probably familiar quotes to you, but all this to say that the purpose of, of the, um, the express purpose of um, the Indian Act and, and the efforts to, um, to have residential schools um, and all the sort of vehicles of colonization have been to assimilate um, uh, the original inhabitants of this land. So um, residential schools is something I wish I didn't have to gloss over, but I will in this particular presentation. Um, but it's relevant, especially when we're talking about aging, because um, so many of the, in, in almost every study um, conversation I'm involved with, um, with older people or people who are working with older people in First Nation communities and in Métis um, uh, communities, really people talk about the trauma that originated from uh, residential schools as a key to understanding chronic disease and to understanding the current um, realities for older people in First Nation communities um, in particular. So, you know, everything from diabetes will have a, you know, a, a session where we're talking about diabetes and people will always be reminding us that, that, it, that these things come from trauma. So you can talk to us about um, walking and eating vegetables, but the, the root is trauma. And they can tell us stories that help us see the path that the trauma has, ta that the trauma has taken them on to the point of having you know, large percentages of people in their communities with diabetes. So and everything from diabetes and dementia to heart disease, these are common. Like, so, so it's really important to understand that root. So these, these, this churning, this absolute disruption that happened, um, and is, it continues to happen, but what, what kind of has, has started to come out of the other side are structures that we think you know, have been there our lives, so we think that's the way it is, but they're really actually, um, they're really actually new, and they're really actually, as a result, uh, things that are coming out of the other side of this churning of colonialism. So, for example, First Nations in Ontario. So, the current context for First Nation communities in Ontario is that pre-contact, there were 13 sovereign nations, usually talked about 13 nations in this area. And then through the process of, of colonization, we now have 133 First Nation communities. Um, that don't always politically align as nations as they used to be, um, but align um, together as tribal councils, as provincial territorial organizations, or PTOs, you may have heard them. And the sort of um, coordinating organization for Ontario is the Chiefs of Ontario. So um, I mention all of this because the Chiefs of Ontario is the key partner in most of the provincial level work that I'm doing with data 
um, in collaboration with First Nations. But all of these things are important because the decision making and the sovereignty lies at the First Nation level. And that's conceptualized at this point um, as those 133 First Nations, not the 13. Um, here, are the, the, here are the 133 First Nations um, in Ontario. And um, I wanted to also mention, although most of my presentation is about the work I'm doing um, in collaboration with Chiefs of Ontario and First Nation communities, uh, we also, I also have quite a bit of collaboration and connection with the Métis Nation of Ontario. So I just want to mention it because sometimes it's something that people don't have an understanding of. And I, you know, I'll, sometimes I hesitate to talk about it because people have different understandings of it, including Métis people. Um, and I'm not a Métis person, so um, I don't want to be talking to Métis people about who Métis people are. But I also want to help people understand that it may not be what you think it is. So um, it's the Métis uh, Nation of Ontario. So go on their website if you want to hear what the Métis Nation of Ontario <laughs> says. And this is a paraphrase of what they say. Um, it's a distinct culture that emerged um, of mixed families who were neither Indian nor European. So it's a distinct culture. It's not, it's not me who has a blonde haired blue eyed dad and First Nations mom. Like I'm not Métis because I have that mix. It's a historic mixing that it, where there's an ethnogenesis, where there's a new culture that emerges. Um, and this is the part that, you know, um, not everybody agrees with, but certainly the Métis Nation of Ontario um, has in their, in their description of who Métis are, is that the, the communities emerged along the lakes and rivers of Ontario, mainly through fur trade um, and, and west, so Ontario and west. So 86,000 people self-identify on the census in Ontario as Métis. Um, the Métis Nation of Ontario has a citizenship registry that's 18,000 to 20,000 people. And that is what, um, that, those are the data that um, I use with the Métis Nation of Ontario and my colleagues use with the Métis Nation of Ontario to answer questions about Métis health. But you can see that because there's this difference, um, it's, uh, it's a small proportion of people who self-identify as Métis. And here's a, just a dis depiction of where the community councils are across um, the province. Uh, okay, so coming back to where we're going, um, I want to talk about specifically First Nation data sovereignty. Um, this is uh, the sort of language of data sovereignty, data governance. It's all sort of emerging in an international context. So there's recently, if you're interested in data sovereignty, you should talk to me because I'm really interested in talking to you. But the, definitely internationally, there's recently a book published about um, indigenous data sovereignty. There's a lot of energy and movement around data sovereignty in very recent times. Um, and so why do we need that? So this process of colonization has led directly to a lack of trust for government and for researchers. And there's a history of research and government intervention and um, just settler intervention in general that is mixed up with research um, that, that has led to this lack of trust. So it's really about taking um, that ownership and the control and asserting the sovereignty that makes this, um, makes data belong to First Nations and be able to be used for the healing of communities. So that's why the title of Data as Medicine, because really data can be used as a healing tool for communities. Um, so be it, throughout time, First Nations health data and statistics could be accessed by researchers, organizations, and government without the knowledge and consent of First Nations. Um, data was interpreted negatively and did not benefit First Nations and didn't take into consideration cultures and history. So even if it was well-intentioned researchers, it can still be splashed as a headline that further stigmatizes First Nation communities. Or so you know, if you if you're already having a hard time, think of yourself. If you're already having a hard time, and then you're constantly faced with messages about how you're not good enough, and how things are going really poorly, and wow, look at that gash on your leg. It looks so it's festering. It's really hurting. 
it hurts more, right? So you, you, we, 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 as researchers, have a responsibility to be listening to First Nation communities when they say that to us. When they say this hurts, or you're doing hurts, we listen, right? We have to listen. So what this is, it, at a national level, there's a whole context for data sovereignty happening. Um, in, in the 90s, the Indian Registry, so that's the registry of all peoples, this is why I want to talk about the Indian Act, so it's all people registered um, as First Nations, registered as registered Indians, the status of you, in um, Canada, would be released regularly by the government without permission. So in, a, in the context of Ontario, Cancer Care Ontario, um, at one point received that registry without the consent, knowledge, or anything of First Nations people and was doing research with it. Um, the SMA First Nations um, also, in parallel, had responded to Census Canada about coming into First Nations communities without permission to collect data. So there's a lot of energy happening around data and about um, and concerns about how data were being used. And I have to say, it's not over. So there was a recent paper that um, was published um, in Alberta where um, First Nations data were used without any mention of engagement with First Nations people. So just because the data are already there doesn't mean they can be used without, um, because it's about that interpretation, it's about that lens, and it's about the permission and the respect. So um, the, the development of OCAP principles, which probably many of you have heard of, but maybe some of you haven't. OCAP, it, um, and it has a trademark, don't forget the trademark. Uh, it's trademarked by the First Nations Information Governance Center. Um, those principles were established and um, have really, really changed the landscape of how data are viewed, First Nations data are viewed. So OCAP stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession of Data, and asserts that any First Nations identified data should be under First Nations control, ownership, access, and possession. Sorry, I just said it was co-op instead of OCAP. <laughs> but so, so this is this has changed the landscape for sure. Um, and this is just a description of what OCAP is, um, which you can definitely. There's a course you can take from FNIGC, First Nations Information Governance Center. You can take an online course to learn more about OCAP, and I really recommend it. It's very um, it's very helpful. Um, and FNIGC talks about the power of data um, and our stories, our data, our future, and that it's by First Nations or First Nations people to have the power to change lives. So it's about, um, it's about really respecting that process. And so FNIGC is also a research partner that um, I've worked closely with as well. And, um, they have the First Nations Regional Health Survey. So all the data that are collected um, from First Nation communities across Canada in the First Nations Regional Health Survey um, sits at the FNIGC, and actually they have a program where you can apply to use the data, and you can go to Ottawa, and you can, um, you can obviously, in collaboration with First Nation organizations or communities, because all First Nation focused research has to be community engaged, then you can, you can use the data. So in Ontario specifically, the leadership of Ontario First Nations, so this is the elected leadership in those 133 First Nations, right? So I know that that glosses over the complexities of off-reserve, on-reserve status, non-status. So just recognize that I recognize that and go with it. <laughs> um, so the Ontario First Nations leaders decided to create the health surveillance system. And they negotiated a data governance agreement with the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. And I'm gonna really try not to say the acronym because it's ISIS, but it might come out of my mouth. So just if it comes out of my mouth, then recognize that I'm not, which ISIS I'm talking about. Um, so provincial health services data are held at ISIS, and they're regularly used to make decisions about Ontario's health system about what's effective, about the health, health status and health care in Ontario. But those data were not, those data were locked to First Nations because there was no identifier. There was nothing to tell First Nations 
groups or organizations or researchers who in the data were First Nations people. So what the, um, what the leadership asked uh, along with, um, so, so who is the Chiefs of Ontario? CCO is Cancer Care Ontario and ISIS. So the three organizations went together to ask for the Indian registry system to bring that to ISIS to unlock the data. So we received a file from um, of all First Nations people, all registered First Nations people, and we're able to link that to the provincial health services data so that the Chiefs of Ontario could receive um, or could engage in research looking at the, the First Nations populations in Ontario. So that's really the unlocking part. They, that was, that's the way that the First Nations can see what's happening in healthcare with their, with their population. So we have a, a data governance agreement between um, with Chiefs of Ontario and the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. So I'm a scientist there, so I'll tend to say we when I start talking about the Institute. Um, and um, we now have, so this is 2016, we have five projects approved that we're working on, and one of them is specific to aging. Here are the regional projects that we're working on. Um, the first is on cancer surveillance, and those results have now gone to the All Chiefs Assembly, so all 133 First Nations chiefs, um, elected chiefs who come together in assembly um, have seen those data. Um, we're working on diabetes, prescription opioid use, uh, a profile of 18 chronic conditions, and this project on aging. So just like to simplify it, we have the provincial health services data at the institute. We have the Indian registry system data that identifies First Nations people who are registered under the Indian Act. And we have a data governance agreement that allows for the community engaged um, and appropriate use of these, these data that um, captures uh, about 200,000 First Nations people in Ontario. So in the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, when I say it's provincial health services data, you can see here that includes physician claims, emergency visits, prescription drug claims, home care, rehab, long-term care. Um, and so and there, there are, I mean, it's, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of data that are available at the Institute. And so it's, in some ways, it's a matter of prioritizing what questions the First Nations have. So we have two mechanisms for, um, oh, sorry, I, I won't go, I won't jump ahead. Um, so we're talking right here about this one way of unlocking the data. So we have the Indian registry system as one way of identifying First Nations people in the data. Um, we also um, have Métis Citizenship Registry, where we work with the Métis Nation of Ontario for their questions, what they want to know of the data. Um, and then we have other ways like geographic identifiers that can be used as a proxy for on reserve. So that's another way we've unlocked the data. And so that way is very helpful for individual communities or for groups of communities where they say, you know, uh, in our um, tribal council for our seven First Nations, we want to know what our diabetes rates are. So then we can use um, geographic identifiers to do that. And then also there's some self-identifiers, but to be honest, um, they, are, they are used in some cases, but um, I, generally the, the First Nations and Métis organizations prefer um, to use registry data than, rather than self-identified data. So here's a model that's sort of emerging. It's not like we started with a model and then everything fits nicely into it. It's sort of like if I give this talk a year from now, the model could look different because it's really, we're just, it's emerging as we go. But really for First Nations data, not for Métis data, but First Nations data, OCAP is in the center. Those are First Nations principles. And then, um, but generally, if we want to generalize it, we could probably put um, uh, something related to the fact that it's um, community engaged use, it's indigenous driven use, decision making happens there um, of the data. And so these are the really important components, ethical relationships, 
um, data governance has to be in place. Formalized data governance has to be in place. It's it's not. It can't just be a handshake or a general agreement or project specific agreement. It's very helpful to have formalized agreements um, that really set the standards. And then um, a methodology and approaches. It's very important that we have indigenous perspectives and models of well-being. For a while, um, we're very much. At the Institute, we're very much service oriented. Like, you ask us a question, we'll give you a bunch of tables, right? But it wasn't as helpful um, as having indigenous researchers helping from beginning to end in, um, in ensuring that there's appropriate um, engagement from elders and in appropriate interpretations that involve community members along the way. So the whole process of the research has to be done differently, um, and that's very important. And um, and the fact that these are, the whole intention is around healing. Um, it's not just so we have more reports. Um, I will talk about this part, basically just this importance of relationships that underline everything. So um, when we come to First Nations aging, so you, you saw that long list of projects. Obviously, um, I, my research, if you look at my CV, in my research CV, it's sort of like, oh, she kind of thinks she can do everything. But it's not that I think I can do everything, it's that I'm trying to facilitate um, First Nations um, and Métis organizations in getting the data that they need, right? So um, I'm sort of more of a, a, a generalist in some senses because it's more about facilitating processes and relationships and, um, and but my own research interest is around aging. So my training and my interest is around aging and dementia. So, um, so, so the projects that I, um, the, like the grant funded projects that I need would be around aging. So, it's often counterintuitive to First Nation partners when I say that because their priorities are so focused on youth, um, many times and rightfully so, or younger adults. But um, there are some key things that I'll messages that I'll, I'll give you when, and one is the the you know population aging kind of perspective, um, and one of the important things is that many of the things we think of as related to aging are happening about 20 years earlier in First Nation communities. So, you know, I, I was working with researchers recently who were very surprised to hear that only 5% of the First Nation population is over 65. I'm like, well, is it really, you know, but that's, the, the 65 isn't the relevant number here in many cases. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing is that the population is also aging. Um, and so, those priorities are shifting in communities, especially as they um, they they attempt to sort of manage the population. So we have a CIHR grant. This is my grandma. Um, so it was profiled up on the CIHR website. And she's very excited to have her picture on the website. I think. Um, so yeah, they, they just said, do you have any relevant or appropriate pictures of older First Nations people? I was like. I think I can take a picture of my grandma. <laughs> um, so, just very uh, like I, don't, I probably don't have a lot of time to go into all the details of the study, but um, really part of the initial initial impetus for doing a study um, looking at um, a looking at sort of frailty from a frailty model and thinking about frailty differently. How do we need to think about frailty? in older First Nations populations was that with the First Nations Information Governance Center, um, they invited me to come and look at the regional health survey data for all of Canada and do something related to aging. So I looked at the, at the data and, and was, was able to derive a frailty index. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, I'm just gonna skip to, for a second. Sorry, this is very disorienting. So what we did was we looked at a frailty index that had been developed for the Canadian Community Health Survey and tried to apply it and was very, were able to very closely apply it 
to the regional health survey. So measuring frailty in a similar way um, in two national surveys, one being First Nation communities and one being the general population. And um, the data will be presented, will be um, published hopefully soon. Um, it's like in, um, it just been resubmitted um, to, to the journal that um, we're working with. And, but basically, you know, looking over age groups, look, it, it, it's clear that 20 year gap is clear. Um, the, there's, there's a, basically you can, you can, on a population level, this profile of the sort of 65 to 74 year olds um, look like the 35 to 45 year olds, you know? So it's quite striking the, 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 um, the difference in frailty. So that was the that was the reason we wanted to do the work, and what um, and and you know talking to the chiefs of Ontario, they were very interested in what was happening with aging in their communities. And so um, the study that we're doing, so this is the disorienting part. I'm just trying to um, move myself more quickly. So we're using the regional health survey for Ontario. I'm doing a similar thing. But going into a bit more depth on covariates and trying to understand what might be happening with a traditional medically driven frailty index. So when I say medically driven, they probably wouldn't think of it as medically driven, but it's still a Western medical framework, right? So even though it's function and it's, you know, it's got um, mobility and things like that as part of it, it's still from our perspective, as uh, from our Western medical perspective. Um, we also, we're doing these sequential focus groups on Manitou and Island with First Nations communities. So we're getting, we're kind of going a little deeper in with those communities. And Kristen Jackman is a medical anthropologist working on that part, leading that part. I'm an epidemiologist, so I um, definitely defer to her on the sequential focus groups. But um, we've got a language group that's translated the concept of frailty and, and then back translated the concept of frailty to try and understand what First Nation perspectives on frailty look like. And although we can't, you know, we're not at the point of sharing that, um, those details, it's very exciting and different, right? So I think it will be, it will help us to derive new measures of frailty that might be more um, appropriate. Because how appropriate is it to say, um, you know, over half of your, uh, over half of your community at age 35 is frail, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it doesn't reflect how communities see themselves. And let's try and reflect what frailty means in those communities. And so that's what this sequential focus groups is about. It's, it's not representative of all First Nations in Ontario, but it's diving deeper in one place so that we can get a better understanding of what frailty might mean in those populations, in, in those specific First Nations. Um, and then we're going to use the administrative data at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences to also look at patterns of multimorbidity and see if we can get at some, some measure of, um, of something that would be more relevant. Probably going to be hard to do with the administrative data, to be honest. But at least looking at, the, the communities are still interested in looking at multimorbidity. So what happens when you have multiple chronic conditions and combinations of chronic conditions and complex chronic conditions and, um, and how, how that plays out in First Nation communities. And in particular, people are quite um, interested in, in what happens to people. Are they able to stay in their communities or do they have to move out? which is often, there's a lot of jurisdiction issues that mean that people with cro complex chronic conditions can't stay in their communities. They, their, their travel is only funded for six months, and there's all sorts of issues, um, policy-related issues. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna just gather myself and try and get to where. So, really, um, the preliminary messages coming out of that that study is that First Nations conceptions of frailty are distinct from medical or Western models and understandings of frailty, um, but that communities currently manage high levels of frailty as we measure it, as it's commonly conceived of and measured in the literature. 
and that um, consistent with much of the other research, First Nations are becoming fairly younger ages than the general population, and that we need better ways of thinking about wellness, age-related wellness. I mean, one of the striking things that um, that Elder was advising our project said was when people are, um, so how did he say it? He, he, he said, you know, when people aren't well and they have all those chronic conditions, then they can't manage it. But when they are well and they have all those chronic conditions, and so in your mind, they're kind of, you know, like, what do you mean you are well and you have all those chronic conditions, right? So there's something different there that indicates frailty that's not about counting chronic conditions. So, um, and without a doubt, with increasing numbers of older people, First Nations communities will need increasing, they will need better evidence. They will need evidence that will convince policymakers about the need for different things. Um, in particular, age-related, um, uh, you know, uh, the, requirements for getting services, you know, we need to be thinking about age a little bit. And we have, um, just finally, wanted to just tell you that there's other um, age, aging and dementia related research happening in parallel through the Canadian Consortium for Neurogeneration and Aging, which is CCNA. There's a whole team devoted to Indigenous um, dementia. Uh, the dementia in Indigenous communities, um, Kristen Jackman and Carrie Barassa are leading. Um, and then there's, it com coming out of those teams, there's these two new CIHR projects. One is to, to develop, test, and validate a new Canadian Indigenous cognitive assessment instrument that um, will be a better um, community-driven and culturally appropriate cognitive assessment instrument. And that will be developed in three provinces and hopefully we'll, by the end we'll emerge something that we can sort of generalize. And then also a project to develop community-based models of care for people with dementia, and that's Janet McElhaney at Health Sciences North Research Institute. Um, so I'd be happy to talk more about those projects that we're just, we just found out about them in December, so it's quite new. Um, and uh, yeah, the road ahead. This is, the, this is my snowy lake where I live. Uh, this is from last, uh, that's my husband skiing, but that this is uh, my reality when I go home. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much and I'm um,